start part two of perceiving music. It's been shown that there are various benefits of musical training. I will say I'm reading a book right now by Robert Jordan called Music, the Brain and Ecstasy. And he talks about composers and how um, they're actually um, not any more intelligent. They don't have higher IQ scores from what people have estimated than, than other people, that it appears that this composing music appears to be something that they're particularly good at, but otherwise they're not um, impressive in some ways. Uh, but I do wanna say that um, there's lots of more recent research and he had, he talks really briefly about this as well. There's lots of more recent research where they've done studies where they're actually doing the experiment. So they are randomly assigning younger children to either um, musical training, which is usually either piano or violin. Um, and then they're comparing that in a nicely designed study to drama lessons. So the children are still getting this extra kind of lesson and they're getting the attention and all of those things we like to see in a nice control condition. And they compare that to a group of children who are just um, education, life as usual, they're going on as they, as they always did without any kind of specific manipulation. And so what they have found, and your author lists all of these in one sentence and it has a bunch of citations after it. And then and, um, some of them I've looked up in other ones I haven't, but musical training has been linked to improved performance in other areas. And a lot of these, again, are nice experimental studies looking at causality where they see better performance in mathematics, a greater emotional sensitivity, especially so in language and hearing um, emotions in language. Uh, in one study, it wasn't just emotions that are um, being expressed in the person's native language, but they listened to a foreign language that they didn't know. And they were also better at hearing the emotional expressions or some of the prosody and intonation that are suggesting these changes in emotion. Uh, they find it linked to improved language skills as well as to, uh, greater sensitivity to timing. Probably the most obvious benefit of music is that it elicits positive feelings. I usually include um, this Juslin and Sloboda and their colleagues uh, multiple mechanisms theory about they tried to come up uh, with a full set of the mechanisms by which music is influencing our emotions and um, they do a pretty good job I feel like they still kind of miss some things maybe although I should probably reread and see what's what's included in some of these uh, mechanisms that maybe I'm not I'm not getting the full mechanism, uh, but there, but it's it's really fascinating to me, and usually it, it leads to a nice think pair share as well as a nice discussion and things that I can do with the class. But since we're um, since we're online, I can't really do as much. But so we we are going to briefly talk about these mo these positive emotions and, and emotions that can be um, induced or influenced, but also the fact that I can have these positive emotions, that this this is the reason a lot of us listen to as much music as we do, right, is, is the effect on our emotions. Um, people cite music's emotional impact and its ability to uh, help them regulate their emotions. I actually had an honor student looking into this, this question uh, for her honors thesis, and a lot of people um, felt that um, they, they liked to relate to a singer and have the same emotions as that singer, that that helps them to think about and to process some of those emotions. So regulating our emotions, processing our emotions. Um, the other thing we can see is that um, people sometimes rate themselves as having this experience of awe or um, transcendence and wonder, which we sometimes called, called awe. Uh, we sometimes talk about this as chills and so in this um, particular research by Blood and Zatori, uh, they looked uh, at regional cerebral blood flow in different areas and, and, and when people had self-selected their music and they were reporting having chills. And what they found was there are many regions that, are, um, that have increased activity uh, and the nucleus accumbens is one of these. So um, those pleasure centers uh, I want to say the striatum, so some of those pleasure centers and other regions 
um, are getting increased activity. The amygdala and the hippocampus, actually on one side, the hippocampus, and on both sides, the amygdala looks like they have decreased activity. If you think about the amygdala, oftentimes processing our more negative emotions that, um, that we're apparently inhibiting some of that. Your author does include all of these as being increased increased activity, but that is not what I found when I went and looked that, that study up. It is a really neat study, and it's been replicated, and people have looked at this with different um, methodologies at this point. But we are, so we're affecting these brain regions. We can have these experiences of chills and awe and all these really positive kinds of emotions. In that multiple mechanisms theory, one of the mechanisms is just episodic memory, that it can help, that it can bring up these episodic memories. And with some of that, maybe some evaluative conditioning that my emotions, I might bring up that memory and the emotions that I felt and have this kind of vivid memory. So what your authors talk about here is music evoked memory or music, music evoked autobiographical memory, that we're bringing up these specific episodic memories from the past that are associated with specific musical pieces, this idea of, hey, this is our song, honey, right? So these memes, as they are sometimes called, even though um, the other kinds of memes becoming so popular uh, to be talked about, it's a little confusing, but memes, these music evoked autobiographical memories are often associated with strong emotions like happiness, nostalgia, um, and, and again, something we've something we've shared, maybe this sense of sense of bonding that we talked about pre previously before. Uh, it can be seen as a therapeutic tool for people who have Alzheimer's disease. I'm going to show a study in the next um, slide, and after the slide after this slide presentation, I'll also include this video um, in the in Blackboard because and this is a really short snippet from um, a documentary called Alive Inside. And I went and looked this up. It is on um, Canopy, and so it's available through the USC libraries if you, want to make, if you want me to make it available. The documentary itself is, it's not just about people with Alzheimer's. This man got a grant to take iPods into nursing homes, and he basically puts the music that these people love onto, so they, they tell them what kind of music they want to hear, and the songs puts them onto iPods, and he basically watches people come alive, people who, um, and Alzheimer's is one of those big ones where we see they're not um, remembering as much, they're not interacting as much, they're not really talking um, a lot sometimes, and um, really brings them back. But it was all kinds of, of people. Um, one of the people was somebody who struggled with uh, bipolar disorder, and she also was just talked about how much the music helped her to um, kind of regulate her emotions and brought back memories and all of this kind of positive stuff. So, and I just have a short little snippet on from YouTube. And so in this study, um, they had healthy control participants as well as participants with Alzheimer's and they were responding to this instruction of describe an event in your life in detail, right? So giving these details. And they did this either after two minutes of silence or after two minutes of listening to, a, to music of their choice. And what you can see in the figure is that for healthy control participants, we're remembering about, we're remembering a lot of details and it's not that influenced by music um, because we are remembering a lot of details. But if we look at the people with Alzheimer's, they are remembering significantly more details after listening to two minutes of music than after um, having two minutes of silence. So it looks like the music is helping to really enrich those memories. Talking about some of the components or aspects of music that um, we were giving as here's our description, we'll start with musical timing. So. And the first piece of musical timing is to talk about the beat or the basic pulse of the music. So if I start on that second measure, and I'm going to start using these words that if I'm sorry if you don't know, but there's little bars on the, on the, um, the staff are denoting separate measures. And we're moving, so when we're moving across time, we're moving along the horizontal 
what I sometimes refer to as the x-axis, but there's really no x-axis. This is the horizontal, and that's giving us the time. And so it's a three, four time. If we get to that second measure, you can see there's a one, two, three, and then one, two, three, one, two, three. The basic pulse of the music is one, two, three, as I have that three, four time. And that is usually when we're listening to music and we're tapping our foot, um, clapping our hands, we're usually doing this to the beat. Now, if we look at um, a really neat study that looked at beat is from Gron and Rowe in 2009, where um, they, they had people in an fMRI and they listened to a beat condition and a non-beat condition. So the non-beat condition, I did go look the study up because um, I had a couple questions about it. And the first was how they created this non-beat condition, because as humans, it would be difficult for us to create something with a non-beat, right? We can have, um, we can we can make changes, we can have syncopation, but it's really difficult for us to think on a non-beat. So, as you all might have guessed, but I did not guess right away. <laughs> and then when I saw it, I was like, of course, that's what they did. They had a computer um, randomly put out with the timing so that the, there would be a no beat. Um, to the condition. And if you remember me saying when we talked when I first described and introduced fMRI, that the way we do this, since there's always brain activity, is to have some experimental condition and we subtract out some control condition to look at what's the activity in comparison to that control condition. And so Gron and Rowe had a beat condition and then they subtracted out that non-beat condition to say what are the what are the brain mechanisms that are more active um, in, in that particular condition. With the, when we're listening to a beat. And first they found increased activity in the basal ganglia. So those orange um, dots are showing us the basal ganglia. And uh, that is a group of subcortical structures that are involved in basically my habitual kind of movements. So moving, they are movement oriented structures. I also think about them as being really important for procedural memory, but they're important for this um, for movement, and especially, especially things we've made habits of. And so if you've been in an MRI, you know, um, and if you haven't been in an MRI, um, talk to someone who has, you, you have to be very, very still. Um, if you move and they're trying to get some information about um, where these structures are in your brain, they'll say, okay, you'll need to be still and we need to start over. So you're basically being very still in this fMRI or in the MRI, MRI machine, and yet your brain is still behaving as if you are moving when you're listening to that beat. The other thing they found was that the connections between the basal ganglia and the motor areas of the cortex were also more active. And so this is the, the blue dots, these motor areas of the cortex, those connections were also more active. I will say the other reason I went to look up this particular study was this picture I think is extremely misleading. It looks like it's coming, like the basal ganglia are in front and the motor structures are in the back of the brain when actually the motor structures are, motor structures are in the frontal lobes and the basal ganglia are subcortical structures, they're down. And so this is actually um, kind of oblique line splice through the brain that does not that did not come out very well in the picture in the book. Um, but just so you know, if you if you kind of know where your brain regions are, that looks messed up. And because it's really looking up and down more than front to back, front to back, if that makes sense. Back to organizing our sound um, through time along the horizontal there. And we're in the beat, the pulse of the music, we can add to that really the meter that organization of those beats into bars or measures with the first being accented. And so before when I was doing the one, two, three, one, two, three, I was really trying hard not to accent, but it's really difficult for me not to accent something. So if we look at our three, four time, it usually goes like this. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, right? And we can think of a waltz that we have that accent on the first beat of the measure typically, and that's actually the way we dance to that as well, right? We step that first step with the one, two, three, has a stronger kind of movement to it. 
in a neat study by um, Iverson and Patel, uh, they had people just listening to this, what would be ambiguous short and long bursts, so short, long, short, long, short, long. And it turned out, so they were looking at whether or not people were more likely to interpret that meter, that timing and um, where the accent would really be, uh, whether they would interpret that as kind of matching their own language. And if we think about how English sounds, that when I say the dog or the store or to go, that typically we have that terminer or that marker or that um, helping verb as the first unaccented. And then we have the book, the dog, the noun, the point of what, like the, you know, right? What gets the, what gets the accent there is um, the second uh, word in that phrase. If we look at Japanese, and I don't have a lot of examples of this because I don't really speak Japanese, but honga, honga is book the. So they have that determiner coming after and the accented word comes first. And if you can see in the um, data, then what ended up happening is with this really relatively ambiguous, just short, long, short, long, English speakers interpreted that as short, long, short, long, or were more likely to interpret that as short, long, short, long. Japanese speakers were more likely to interpret that as long, short, long, short, matching our respective languages. Finally, as we get to the most kind of complicated piece of this, um, of the timing, we get to rhythm, which is the time pattern that is given to us by the durations that are created by the notes themselves. And so in this, uh, and I think I did this again a little bit before with the one, three, and. So when I was doing that before, that was actually kind of giving the rhythm and I tried to do one, two, three, one, two, three <laughs> for the beat. But so if I'm looking at the rhythm, I actually have a three and one, two, three, one, three and one, two, three, one, three and, right? That is the rhythm. And it is really more complicated than the beat or the meter. I'm gonna end this second part here by talking about syncopation, a kind of more complicated aspect of um, rhythm and meter that, uh, that we usually talk about, um, that we have this, we very often now create these syncopated rhythms where we add these notes before the before the basic rhythm starts and it, it makes that rhythm feel a little bit offbeat and so if we look at a where i have a one two three four i can add this and make it a little bit more complicated and you could hear um, a more complicated rhythm with one and two and three and four and but then i can add this eighth note at the beginning, have this kind of and, which so I added in this and before the one and two and three and, and it actually um, shifts things over in such a way that we start to, it starts to sound, the, the rhythm is more complicated. It has this offbeat feel is the only way I know how to describe this kind of syncopation, which gets used a, a lot in jazz and more often now in, in popular music and, and, and rock and roll than, than it used to. We might include some specific properties to try to describe music, um, but which of these are meaningful, which of them are truly have to be part of music um, versus also how meaningful are these properties to someone who hasn't experienced music. So we can talk about pitch changes. And I've talked about pitch as being low pitched or high pitched, right? So we can, we can change our pitch and kind of describe that to someone. And we can describe how pitch, if we have a sequence of pitches, pitches that are perceived as belonging together, that's gonna give us a melody. We can talk about the temporal structure of music. So that temporal is always talking about time, right? So that we are, um, organizing information or sounds through time. And that so we are organized, music organizes time for us. Uh, we might talk about um, time dimensions where regular beats are organized into measures. And then there's a time pattern created with the 
by the notes within that, which gives us our rhythm. So we might use those specific words for music, but without the kind of description of them. Again, we can't just say, well, it has beats and rhythm and melody because that's those things aren't meaningful to somebody who hasn't experienced music. I have a few more here. 